everybody can hear and see you. That's good. I, uh, it was so overloaded. I've been actually looking at the market for, or looking at the um, sort of the open uh, situation for about two or three hours. And uh, um, every, every time I think I've got it uh, sussed, um, uh, another barrage of information has come through. So I thought I'd just uh, look at a few of the bigger companies just to start off with. Um, on uh, Vodafone, um, it's raised its full, uh, full year forecast um, for earnings growth up to 10%, which is uh, quite amazing, I would suggest. And then uh, Tesco has got the nod uh, from the competition regulator as far as its uh, takeover of Booker. We'll have the, well, uh, the nod there. I'm not sure if that means it's going to definitely go through or not. Uh, presumably, uh, the competitors, its competitors, uh, will not be quite uh, as pleased as Tesco will be um, over the near term. Um, other t other uh, situations, I suppose, um, just looking at the uh, the major markets, a um, bit of a bump to the upside uh, for uh, uh, the euro uh, and for uh, actually also for um, uh, the DAX and a bump to the downside for uh, gold uh, back down to 12.73. Uh, but just wanted to point out one of the things that um, I use and which is quite useful, and I suppose it's not important about them, it's not, it's not a sort of obscure thing to, to trade with, but uh, uh, pivot levels or the pivot method. Uh, yesterday's high loan close divided by three is the pivot level for the following day. Uh, so you can see here the DAX um, opened rather overnight, basically um, held above that pivot level at 137.2. Uh, you have a resistance level up there, 130, um, one, uh, sorry, 113, 185. And uh, that just gives you sort of a trading uh, map for the day. Um, clearly, if you break back below the, what well, the normal rule is, if you're above the pivot, you tend to you know, be a buyer on dips and uh, below it, um, seller into strength. Um, but probably the, the most interesting example today would be on the FTSE, where we're just heading up towards uh, the pivot level of the day, which is 74.32. Uh, you would be going short against that uh, particular notional resistance and then trying to target the first support 7390 so a bit of a, a tip there a trading tip it's one of the best words well, is a classic tip it's it's, it's the uh, the method that traders on the on the floor floors to the um, exchanges and uh, to give you an idea for instance you've got um you've got a situation with the uh, with the uh, the pound there with the pivot uh, one to one uh, 31 87 and basically we started off today just failing at that uh, level um, about um, an hour ago and uh, just clambering to hold on to support um, but i think it's probably time to go to the first guest isn't it simon uh, <clears throat> yes well just a few minutes we've got russell jones uh with you now um if you'd just like to uh, okay. a couple of comments for him and then we'll be going across to david cheatham at xtb broker so uh just just a couple of minutes if you want to get russell jones input I don't know. Can you hear me, guys? Can you hear me? We can hear you very well. Okay, cool. Um, look, obviously, I, I just a quick introduction. I'm just a private trader, but I'm actively trading. I trade reasonable volumes. And obviously, in this sideways market situation, uh, I just wanted to talk about one topic area this morning, which I've missed out on to a large extent, except for the last couple of months. Obviously, everyone's heard of the FANG stocks, and I've always been reticent against going into big value tech in America. I'm not a lover of Netflix. But just to give an overview in terms of, I'm not going to promote these stocks, incidentally, but just to give you an overview, Facebook up 57.5%, Amazon 58.4%, Netflix 74.5%, and Alphabet 399 this year, and that's not including the likes of Microsoft. Now, where the massive money is going to be made, where everything's going into China, uh, and obviously there was an expose on CNBC which opened my eyes up to it, which is the bat stocks. Now, some of you may or may not be aware of bat stocks, but obviously BAT stands for Baidu, Alibaba and Tencent. Now, uh, there's another one too, which is JD.com, and there's some peripheral stocks. It's not that easy to invest directly into the Chinese market uh, unless you do it uh, through, I do it through AJ Bell and Hargreaves. However, you've got to be aware you're buying on a forex charge to buy and sell, although there's not really a trading commission. So I have a 1% charge in, 1% charge out, but there's a tendency of our holding basis but if we take those stocks as an example growth year to date the lowest one is Beidou at 48 percent up alibaba 107 percent up 10 cent 108 percent up jd.com at 73 percent up 
A lot of people may not have heard of JD.com, but they're the, they're the Amazon equivalent, where obviously they're working on a, a large platform expansion with low profit margins, which is the total difference and main competitor to Alibaba, which obviously didn't have the retail scenario which you see in the UK, so they didn't have the competition aspects. However, they were bolstered by massive funds supporting the likes of Amazon in its infancy. So Alibaba is hugely profitable, most profitable retailer in the world. There's over 60% of transactions on finance in China, and obviously is the largest revenue of cloud. Now, Alibaba and Tencent are two top 10 valuations, $500 million almost, and they are going to grow and grow and grow. The middle economy in China, which they reckon um, is now, Singles Day was an example, Alibaba, $25 billion, but the, what we forget is JD.com to $19.1 billion, so it's $44 billion between two companies. China is going to take over the world. 90% of growth is going to be in, outside of Europe. Asia is going to completely go ahead and carry on growing and growing. I've got a friend just living outside of Shanghai. There's not an issue in relation to debt. Most of them have got massive savings in cash. This is a liquid going forward organization. Wish I'd gone in earlier, but I would suggest to buy in a sideways market with tax exceptions problems in America, not getting that bill to look at everyone's anti Trump. Uh, I think that where we see a retraction possibly, not Santa Rally this year, these are long term holds with great returns, and some of them pay divvies. So that's just a quick overview. All right, just I mean, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the chart of Alibaba now, and um, yeah, obviously it's gone up uh, so almost in a straight line. I mean, if there are any negatives on on the China, you know, buying the Chinese equivalent of uh, U.S. stocks, what would you say they are? Well, the only the only negative impact on it is if we have regulation from the Chinese central government. But if you take ten cents on an account, it's twenty three percent. They've got seven thousand communist employees. Now, obviously, ten cents. Uh, I know you're looking at Alibaba. So it's a generalisation, though. So, ten cents, which obviously controls WeChat, which is the the equivalent of what people chat on, but obviously it's regulated in China. These have been given the go ahead. I cannot see, you know, when we talk about Trump doing a trade deal, Alibaba is an example, and we're talking about pork being allowed to go into China. Alibaba did a deal about four months ago. And they did a one one off transaction for just marketing pork to the Chinese, which he pork has never gone out of fashion. It was one and a half billion of pigs. One and a half billion in one transaction. Ten cent has just bought some people may not like it, they bought ten percent of Snapchat straight away. Um ten cent just floated on the Hong Kong stock market, a peripheral part of their business. It's raised billions overnight, only in the last week. These companies are the equivalent of today's Bitcoin outside of the stock market, and they're going to go exponential. You know, we've got 1.4 billion people in China, of which 300 million are wealthy. Um, you know, property prices in the likes of Shanghai... But you're basically, you're basically, but you're, go on. But you're basically on, saying that it's, it's almost like they're doing, they're doing so well, um, these companies, uh, these key players, that, even if on. there was... Um, the odd, yeah, the odd, um, let's say, uh, turbulence uh, from the Chinese government, it wouldn't really make much difference, make uh, that much difference. No, no, and the reason I'm saying this is because obviously, although I am a trader in and out, and, you know, my probably my largest kind of risk position at the moment is Carillion, and I, I've also got, you know, another one which has dropped dramatically this morning on the UK stock market, which is Provident Financial. Um, the reality is that whereas you gamble on those kind of stocks, you can do them on a large position, and as you, you know, that for myself, I've made a, a, quite a lot of money on miners over the last two years. Um, the UK, I don't like Europe. I think it's going to fall apart. Um, but, you know, I won't go into that now, separate subject. But, you know, when you look at America, it's had a great run. Without chance, it's going to come back. These are safe plays to stick your money. The plays yesterday were people were coming out of standard transactions and going to divvy plays. I can talk dividends, hence BP, Shell, HSBC. There's various dividend plays now, so obviously you protect your money even if you're an asset fall of 7%. But more and more people that trade the stock market are people now which are semi-pensioners or pensioners trading their funds as they're taking them out. They're working them out of SIPs. So not everyone wants to gamble with extreme small value stocks. These are ma massive market capitalization stocks. 
And whereas I don't see Netflix continuing to roar ahead at 74% up because there's too much competition, the Chinese market is different because it's such a massive market. And don't forget, the likes of Alibaba are killing the likes of Indonesia, Vietnam. All these areas are growing exponentially. I see... I honestly see Alibaba as a two trillion company bigger than the Saudi float in two to three years' time. All right, can you just give me one minute on Carillion and on Provident Financial just to cheer us all up? Well, Carillion, I put a shitload of money into there, if I'm honest with you. Um, I've taken a bit of a risk. They, they were kitchen sinks, possibility of going bust. Um, I looked at the factors, they appointed a new CEO, which starts on the 2nd of April. Uh, well-respected guy in the industry, Bobis Holmes were chasing him down. 2016, he won CEO Builder of the Year, um, Andrew Davis. Uh, they've appointed another chap, which failed to save Jarvis, but he's respected in the industry. He started last week, and he's a non-exec kind of um, recovery director. Now, Carillion have had an extension on their loans. They don't have to pay them back until 2019, which has given them a cash flow of about $300 million to play with. They still get, that, there is a danger in there because they have a large repayment charge above standard rate, and obviously that's going to cost them $120 million a year. However, they've stopped the dividend, which was far greater than that. They, they've got cash flow in the bank, so um, there's not a problem in terms of last in the two years. They're still getting contracts. The issue is, obviously, do you invest in them like I've done? And there's a rights issue which comes in. I don't think there will be one before Christmas. The full year results are on the 6th or the 12th. I, it's a big risk, but the upside could be a pound stock quite easily. Downside, 30p, 25p. So if you're a gambler, right. there's one to punt on. PFG. Right. Um, and finally, PFG. So at PFG, I think there's a bigger upside there on a safer term. It's 822 on the market this morning, down 3.5%. It's been up around 960, but as some of you may know, it was a £30 stock. It dropped dramatically back at £17 million in a year. Again, kitchen sink screwed up the home loan business, the probably part of it. That normally has a revenue of about uh, a third of their profits. Then there's an imposition into the card. Um, and obviously the card, uh, the maximum debt you're looking at is 100 to 250, sorry, not debt. Um, it's like, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's um, not a debt, it's a fine. So it's a fine of between 100 and 250 million, but the cash flow is fine. Again, this is a recovery, this will happen, but obviously it depends if obviously it's gonna happen by uh, April. I see this twelve pound stock by April. There's two side equivalents of this which have taken up the mantle. Of the change happened with the doorstep lending. They changed the reorganisation from self-employed to employed full timers. And the two which are going to benefit is Moore's Club, which is number two, small cap business, hundred and thirty. That should have about a hundred and seventy price by full year results, which come out around May. And the other one, which is a long side thing, uh, is non-standard finance run by um, the ex-chairman um, of Provident. Um, and he's obviously going to criticise them. But again, a solid business, and I see that on the upside too. So there's three there in that sector of non-standard loans. There's 10 million people in the UK which can't get a loan unless they go to a bloody debt collector in terms of someone around the streets or put their wife on the street. So basically, these companies, these companies are going to have a recovery because people are still spending in the UK. So okay. Okay, Russell. Russell, that's I, I, that's uh, as much information as uh, probably anybody could uh, wish for. Um, uh, excellent uh, updates there on on PFG and and Korean. Do you want me to stay um, open on the line? <laughs> I can chip in on anything if you want or not. If you feel like chipping in um, uh, later in the show, um, we would be delighted. Uh, but I think I'll we'll, go on to our first, we'll go on to our first Thanks. official Thanks. guest now, I think. Yeah, thank you, Russell Jones. We're, we're going to be talking shares again later on um, in the hour with John Adamson from sharetalk.com. But uh, Zach, we're going to go over to David Cheatham now uh, to, to talk about cryptocurrencies and um, have, a, have a look at what's been happening in that busy market. So thank you, Russell, for your for your input there. No problem. If you want to take me or leave me on the subject, I'll be quiet. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
Zach, I think we have David Cheatham already um, here and waiting, which is great. Uh, David, I've taken your microphone off. Um, good morning to you. Hello, good morning. How are you doing? We're very well, thank you. I'll hand you over to Zach. Yes. Hello, David. How are you doing? Hello. Hi. Um, you, you, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Okay, it sounds Hello. like you might not be able to hear um, Zach. Uh, David, I can certainly hear you and you can hear me, which is great. Let's go, go across to make you the presenter. Um, I'm just sending you the, the presentation um, acknowledgement. If you can press the presenter button. We can... Hello. <coughs> Hello. Sorry, I think there's a little technical issue. I'm back now, I think. Can you hear me okay? Great. Yes, we can hear you. Um, we're looking at your X Station 5 platform. Perfect. So great. So you're okay. here to um, an update on the on the cryptos. Yeah, so I'll speak um, mainly about Bitcoin. I'll also touch on Dash a little bit. I know Owen from Two Day Trading is on the show later, and I think he'll be talking also more about cryptocurrencies. But, um, so yeah, the the main place to start really is Bitcoin, and we saw that stunning decline last week in the market. Um, price hit an all-time high last Wednesday of 7,862, and then there was the announcement that a software upgrade called Segwit Director is being cancelled. You can see we've had a large drop in the market dropped around 31%, um, down to mid 5,500s. And just to take you back, really, put this in some longer-term perspective, this is a daily Bitcoin chart going all the way back to May. And um, we've had three notable declines now. This is the third. And the first drop came actually um, around the early summertime from June, where the price had hit what was then an all-time high around 3,000, and we had a drop then of around 38%. You can note all three of these declines have been similar in size. We got 38% here, we had a 39% drop back in September, and we had a 31% drop so far. Um, I'm not so sure this sell-off's necessarily over, although we did get some positive price action yesterday. And we held what now I think is quite important support around 5,490. Um, what's interesting about this market, firstly, if you look at it from a fundamental point of view, each of these declines has been um, caused by fairly well known fundamental reasons. First off, we had the um, initial fork that we saw this year where Bitcoin Cash was created. There was a lot of uncertainty going into this. We saw, as I say, a 38% drop from just about 3,000 down to around 1850. Um, once this passed without too much disruption to uh, Bitcoin, you can see we had quite a strong move high. We break above there. Um, we made a high of around 5,000 in late August, early September. And then there was the Chinese clampdown where they banned the ICOs and they also um, stopped local one denominated uh, cryptocurrency wallets. You can see we also had a big drop here. This was when Jamie Dimon, the JP Morgan CEO, uh, labeled Bitcoin a fraud. I don't think in itself was really. Uh, catalyst for the decline, but it's only coincided with the decline. But more recently, we've had this news that the software upgrade's cancelled. Um, what's also important to note, not just the fundamentals, the technicals. So if you're used to trading other markets, the technical analysis you use on other, say, FX pairs or shares, it's quite transferable. You can see we had a lovely resistance level here at 2,990. Textbook breakout with a gap. Pull back down for a lovely retest, and then we searched higher. And then we had a breakout here around 4867, since then we've continued higher. And now we've pulled back to what was price support at 5490. So the technicals can play out quite nicely for this market as well as the fundamentals. So if you are aware and keep abreast of the fundamentals, you can have maybe a slight edge in getting in positions a little bit quicker. But if you're purely a technical trader, these are also quite nice to trade. Um, just a little more closely at last week's decline, this is an hourly chart now. You can see the market was taking off here. It was actually up around 10% on the day. When this news fell that um, Segwit 2x was suspended, this was the software upgrade that's been long expected. Um, essentially, Bitcoin itself is not actually very useful as a currency at the moment. Transaction times are slow, transactions are quite expensive. Um, but I think there's been a widespread expectation that this would be sorted and this would be improved with the software upgrades. And um, now that this has been suspended, it's not been cancelled, the official line is suspended. Um, although a lot of people believe that will mean it will ultimately be cancelled. Um, so there is a chance this could go through in the future, but if it doesn't, it really does threaten Bitcoin as the sort of clear market leader, I believe, in cryptocurrency space as 
several other cryptocurrencies are a lot better prepared and a lot have a lot more desirable characteristics for a currency in terms of carrying out transactions. But again, we had a really nice pullback. You can see clear support here at 7,090. Yeah, it's next book break. It's one hourly chart. If you want to trade this, you can obviously enter a short position after the break to stop above the candlestick. So we fell all the way down to around 5,500, which was that longer term support. We held below and now we've come back. And now today, I think an important area to look for is 6, 680 on the upside, possible resistance. We've had a couple of false attempts to break above here. You can see with long wicks on the candle. And we're just consolidating now, almost ahead of waiting for the next move. I've just got a, couple, a question uh, there for you, David. Yeah. Um, you, you've talked yeah, sure. about uh, the, TA, the, the TA here being transferable from other markets. Um, from my perspective, the, the TA here is probably better than other markets. It's a, it seems to be a purer market, uh, has the flow, um, you know, the retest, or you know, the, you've seen, you know, as you described, I mean, the, the pullbacks have been um, very, uh, let's say, regular and very understandable support, new old, support, old resistance, new support. Um, is there an ironic situation here that's actually one of the best markets to trade? From a well, I, I think it is. I hear a lot of people saying TA can't be used on these markets, but I think it works, like you say, possibly even better. Um, at the end of the day, all TA is is trying to predict other market participants' actions from what's happened previously. And obviously, if you have less participants in a market, say cryptocurrencies, it be clearer and easier to understand what they'll do and where they'll react. You have a very liquid um, FX per se, for instance, euro, US dollar, you get so much noise and you have so many different participants, you can get more false breaks. I find, I find cable, to be honest, is, uh, from a trading perspective, cable, you have a lot of false breaks and a lot of false moves compared to other markets. And these crypto countries have actually been very clean and uh, very nice. Um, I mean, another example here is Dash. Um, so we offer five crypto countries. This is Dash, one of the smaller altcoins, if you will. And you can see here we had a successful announcement of a software upgrade on Sunday. So again, a big fundamental reason, but the technicals played out quite nicely. Um, there's a level that I just want to add, around 350, um, which had been acting as nice support, our uh, resistance of everything. And you can see here once more. Um, so this was all-time highs. Whilst Bitcoin is up around 700% this year, um, all the other coins that we offer, so that's Dash, Litecoin, Ethereum and Ripple have had far larger percentage-wise gains, uh, talking two to 3,000 for most of those. And you can see here, once we made these all-time highs previously, again, back in the summer, we broke up, and we broke up through here. And you can see that once we broke this level, we did actually um, make a strong move to the upside, hit the all-time high around 390. And then like you say, a really nice pullback, retest, kiss of this level. We had the falling trend line there, <clears throat> and um, since then we've actually um, pulled back nicely. And like I say, we're looking um, quite nice when we pull back into this area, held this level, break uh, this trend line, and then once we took off here and went above for we saw almost doubled in value to 493, and then the pullback stopped almost to the tick <clears throat> at the previous all time high of 391. So, Technically, they seem to be working quite nicely. Um, what you need to bear in mind if you are trading them technically is the spread is a little bit wider than FX pairs. So whilst H1 maybe on Bitcoin is about the shortest time frame I'd look to go down to, some of these others you do need to use maybe daily moves and you need to have a little bit wider stop losses. But I think they're certainly um, quite nice to trade from a TA or a fundamental yeah, the other question was actually, yeah, I mean, would you trade, I mean, I'm trading uh, Bitcoin in Bitcoin at a, at a, a, a rather obscure uh, um, platform, um, well, uh, obscure in terms of uh, the FCA, perhaps. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the, they're the spread, I suppose, with the sort of un hidden charges and everything else might be uh, five dollars on Bitcoin or maybe under ten. Um, the, the, the conventional place is it's twenty twenty five. Um, it is rather off, off putting, and you, you rather wonder why those spreads are so wide, don't you? <laughs> um, and the spread is simply a reflection of the underlying market and as I was saying it's not quite as liquid market as typical FX pairs or um, you know, large cap stocks or indices. Um, so that's why you have a wider spread when you trade it. You also need to think I believe of the spread in terms of percentage daily move or percentage moves. Um, if the spread seems comparably wide but you can see some of these moves here, I mean if we just 
go back to Bitcoin. We've had a 30% drop in uh, five days. Um, when you have a spread that is, say, at the minute, what are we talking, around $15, uh, $15. that seems wide, but when you're dropping $2,400 in the um, course of four or five days, the spread really becomes a very minor cost to you. Um, at the end of the day, like I say, it's not ideal, I don't think, to trade very short term or to scalp if you're looking at doing M15, M5 sort of strategies. Certainly believe daily and H4. And if you're looking for these larger moves, again, like I said, you see the scale of this move in flash. So we've gone from 20 to 494. Um, the spread really becomes a minimal cost relative to that. So one shouldn't be one, one shouldn't be too mean or capable too much on, on the spread factor. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't catch. I mean, I think it seems, I mean, having, you know, I've been a broker, so I've seen how, you know, private investors or, you know, retail traders behave. And if the spread is large, they tend not to cut a, a, a bad position, for instance, just because they're trying to save a few pips or whatever it is. Um, and it just interferes with maybe the way that, the, the way that they trade. Um, obviously, here there'd be massive moves, and it wouldn't matter even if the spread was fifty dollars on Bitcoin. If you were, you know, if you sold at seventy five, yeah, I mean, six thousand. It can it can play a part, but I think, like you say, it's really psychological that, and you should always try and focus on the price itself rather than the spread. Um, and if you have, I always believe, whenever you enter trade, you should have a premise or a reason for that trade, and then once you're proven wrong, and um, that should be where your stop loss is that you have to trade. So, for instance. Say in Bitcoin here, <clears throat> let's say you thought this suspension of the Segwit 2x wasn't a signal to expand, it was going to go higher again. If you're looking to buy anywhere around here, this is quite clear uh, support, you should have a stop loss just below here. Um, if you're buying here, you shouldn't really still be long, in my opinion, once it's dropped here, you certainly shouldn't here, and you certainly shouldn't all the way down here. So I wouldn't um, let external um, factors such as spread <clears throat> really determine where you place your stop loss. Um, obviously, account for it in terms of if you need to give a little bit wider where the bid and the ask is. But because it's a wide spread, I wouldn't necessarily have your stop loss in a different place. To where you would All right, just putting you on the spot, I mean, I suppose so the way I'm looking at Bitcoin, you've got the 50 day average at uh, 68.85 at the moment. Uh, Probably trading short against that, um, unless uh, unless we get unless you get blown out, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, personally for Bitcoin, I think a lot of things still suggest it's an uptrend. Um, however, I think this recent development fundamentally does really threaten its role as a market leader. And, uh, for me, I wouldn't be surprised if we did get more down. So like I said, I think there's previous lows around 5490 is very key level. If we do get any sort of reversal signals around here, I think it could be a nice opportunity to go short and look for a pullback lower. And um, these drops previously, excuse me, 39%, and basically had a positive resolution at the end. And I think until we get back up to here and we start breaking back towards all time highs, possibly can take out the highs, then um, the outlook does look like this fundamental development could really weigh on it. You can see we have this rejection candles here. And um, I do believe we could get a deeper pullback, certainly. If we do break below this 5490, we could retest. This is the next big level, I think, around 4867. And if we go below there, we could we could even get a big pullback. You've got to remember, we've had such a big run up so far this year. And a lot of this has been on the premise that one, Bitcoin will be more widely adopted in terms of a currency for actual transactions. And two, in bar that this software upgrade would go through. And without the software upgrade, like I say, it's not very useful as a currency. Um, its characteristics, like I say, in terms of cost and speed, are far slower than traditional currencies. And I think we've obviously had a lot of speculation on the long side, people looking to jump on the long side of this and think it will go much higher. Um, but at the minute, it's not really fit for purpose for a currency. And I think we could get a significant drop in Bitcoin itself. Um, if we don't see some sort of resolution of these transaction costs and transaction speeds. David Cheatham from XTB Brokers, thank you very much uh, for your uh, comprehensive input today. I'm sure you've, uh, um, it's, it's, it's just an area which seems like rocket science to so many, so I think you've demystified it uh, very well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David, uh, from me, Simon. Um, Zach, I think we're just going to go across to Owen Robert, who is 
one of two blokes that trade. Um, the two blokes trading uh, podcast, which uh, we all know and enjoy, uh, Owen has been uh, getting to grips with trading Bitcoin himself and uh, has agreed to come on and share some of his thoughts uh, with us. So what we'll do um, is bring Owen into the the room. Owen, your microphone is off now. Um, are you okay for me to go across and make you the presenter? Okay, we'll just wait, we'll wait a few minutes. I don't know if Owen's able to hear us. Owen, if you're on the line, your microphone is unmuted, so you should be able to speak back to me now. Okay. I think we've got a little bit of a, hit, a problem there with, with Owen uh, coming into the event like that. I can hear some. Owen, are, are you there? Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Um, good morning, Owen. It's Simon here. Hello, good morning. Sorry. Great good morning. Zach. Sorry, you... didn't like my mic for a second there, guys. Yeah, I, I thought I could hear something going on. I knew you were <laughs> plugging in. Good morning to you. Thanks for joining. Um, are you okay for us to go across to your screen to make you the presenter? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Great. So we'll do that screen share. Um, just to explain to people, you've been, you're obviously one of the two blokes that trade. We seem to be having some problems. Owen, are you still there? We can see your screen. Zach, can you confirm if you can hear me? I hear you very well. Um, we could just have a look at my, maybe a few of the stock movers of the day for, for having difficulties there. I think we have to move on. I think we'll we'll move on. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back to you. If that's all right. Yeah, just uh, just on the on the stock side, um, uh, we had the news. I mean, I, I think it's probably a a happy day in some in, in, or understandable day uh, for a change in the sense that uh, the Vodafone uh, which, which up up uh, graded its uh, uh, forecasts uh, shares up there four percent, so it's back towards the high of the, uh, the recent range. I'll put the chart on in a sec. Um, Tesco, obviously, with the um, the, the the nod, um, on the initial nod on the uh, Booker takeover as well, um, up five percent. So uh, that is a, a nice situation. And then uh, on the on the small cap side, you see they're on the most actives as well. Um, we've got IQE Group, one of the heroes of the uh, the year to date. Um, just look at the um, those three stocks um, from a charting perspective. Uh, Vodafone, there was supposed to be some. Uh, M and A uh, murmurings, perhaps uh, now with the uh, the better guidance there, uh, um, that might go away. But uh, you can see the shares gap to the upside there. Actually maintained uh, they maintained the channel I drew quite a while ago there. Uh, now 200 day moving average support towards uh, uh, 213 pence. Uh, best case scenario here probably um, we hit the top of that April channel up to two pounds fifty. Been waiting for a long time for this, uh, so I suppose one one would want to see whether we. Uh, Get blocked by the 230 level yet again, um, but I believe um, at this, even at this price, um, the the stock is yielding a, a decent uh, whack, maybe four or five percent. So uh, still looks uh, very attractive uh, on a technical and a fundamental basis at the moment. If you're for RSI watchers as well, uh, triple bounce off this um, RSI 50 zone um, can be a good leading indicator uh, on the upside. As far as Tesco is concerned, see that. Uh, We've got um, the shares uh, gapping through both the 50 and 200 day moving averages. Uh, talked about that rocket launcher formation with David Paul yesterday, um, which is, um, there's no other name for it at the moment, uh, that type of uh, 
gap higher from uh, from support. Um, so obviously, uh, the fundamental driver there, the competition um, commission or competition authority, uh, uh, waving through that uh, deal. Um, situation now probably got to, let's say 180 or the top of the, the bottom of the, sorry the top of that gap at 180 as uh, your stop loss uh, are looking for again as in the case of Vodafone these shares to finally break out they've been bogged down here uh, towards uh, 180 uh, for well, sort of quite some months now six months or so so uh, quite frustrating but maybe this will be finally be the driver uh, to get these uh, shares back um, on a um, an upward tra trajectory obviously the all-important Christmas uh, season coming up to so the market will be anticipating uh, that as well and then finally uh, IQE um, here you can see um, again uh, we just want to, it's a, a beautiful uh, um, chart um, over recent months um, I suppose for me uh, I think uh, you know the, we, you, you had the break above the uh, the 200 day line uh, 30 pence I was watching it then I haven't actually watched it for a long time um, uh, since but uh, gap now to the upside uh, rising trend channel uh, probably towards um, uh, the one pound 80 one pound 90 area uh, probably 190 I would say on that uh, that particular channel and then the stop loss I suppose back just below uh, previous uh, resistance what's that 158 something like that uh, but uh, the gap shows surprise in the market um, a few bears possibly caught out there and uh, so we could squeeze up towards the, uh, the 190 uh, level. Uh, just see if there's any other um, stocks uh, situations to look at uh, amongst the uh, uh, the movers today. Uh, Hemogenics, um, uh, the, uh, the blood uh, cells group and the stem cells group, there um, up a bit again, up eight uh, percent. That was uh, identified yesterday after their news. Booker obviously up uh, on the Tesco uh, news. So another another stock there actually, which has uh, been uh, quite. Uh, um, um, so intriguing purple bricks uh, here you can see that uh, stock um, well off the, uh, the the highest levels um, just get that now well off the highest levels um, but it, it sort of uh, even though there's been a lot of bearishness associated with it uh, been reluctant uh, to go down key support there was around the 340 uh, 350 level uh, and even though we've broken that uh, initially uh, this uh, this month uh, seems to be really loath to go much lower than that sort of 300 to 350 area. A lot of support there uh, towards 280 as well. So uh, an interesting one to watch. Probably for me, um, really, it's the 200-day line, 364, which is the, the line in the sand. But uh, messy volatile situation. You can see that the market is actually quite uh, um, divided in terms of how to look at this stock. Okay, Zach, thank you for that. Uh, on the, the stocks, uh, apologies to everybody um, at the audio difficulties we've had over in Robert's at the Dutch trading. Uh, hopefully we'll get them back uh, tomorrow or later in the week. Um, but we've heard uh, also David Cheatham on the latest with Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, we've had uh, some news on, on shares and stocks. We're going to go back to stocks with John Adamson at ShareTop um, in uh, about 10 minutes. But uh, now we're going to have a look at some Forex, and I'm pleased to say that we've got uh, Fotis Papathiofanous from the Fotis Trading Academy, uh, who's going to come and give us some Forex updates. So, uh, Zach, if it's okay with you, we'll cross the presenter role to Fotis and um, bring him into the room. Good morning, guys. Thank you for having me on the show. Can you hear me? Good morning, Fotis. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. You're com coming through loud and clear. And we are looking at your um, slide. We seem to have two, two charts. So I'll, I'll let you explain what, what we're looking at. Uh, yes, thank you, Simon. Let me explain a, a few things. Uh, in the past, it was easier to trade Forex. You know that regimes change in the past, maybe it was a little bit easier because the factors that are affecting the currency movements were distinctive. For example, we could base our decisions on the carry trade, which currency is yielding the, the highest interest rate, fundamentals, inflation, growth, uh, and so on. Unfortunately, right now, to use one of uh, uh, Zach's phrases, <laughs> we have what he calls the macro waffle. Unfortunately, lots of political 
events are affecting the fundamentals and expectations about what is going to happen next. We need to identify this because this will present us with opportunities and help us protect from uh, risky situations. As we are approaching the end of the year, you can see on the left here on this chart, you can see the market profile of the 10-year US bonds. Uh, the good thing is that it is becoming more correlated to the US index, which is on the right. And in the next few weeks, a battle is going to be given at the bottom of the balance of, uh, uh, of a 10-year US bond. The market tried to push back inside value, tried to push higher on news that the so-called tax cuts are not going to move forward. There, there was a problem at the Senate uh, that caused the US dollar index to pause for a while, but now we have improvements, we have expectations that we are going to have four interest rate hikes in 2018, some progress with the tax cuts, but again, all this is expectations, not hard facts. But the thing is, right here in this area, there is a battle. Uh, the US index still has some momentum left to the upside, because of the actions in the 10-year bond, but the factor that will determine what happens, are we going to have a breakout in the US dollar index higher? Or are, uh, what happens with the US bonds? The factors are political, mostly. Are we going to have a development with the tax cuts or not? What happens with the administration? And let me remind everyone uh, that we have a civil war at the Republican Party. Right now, you have Donald Trump. He has unleashed Steve Bannon. Try, uh, and, and he's fighting the, the establishment, the elite of the Republican Party, led by Mitch McConnell. So that is going to be very important. It is going to affect the yield curve, and it is going to affect the US dollar index. In another chart, I'm going to show you just to understand the differences and why I, I have a positive outlook on the euro uh, in the medium to longer term. The yield right now at the 10-year uh, Germany uh, bond is, uh, as I can see, 0 0.39. The 10-year German bond, 0 0.39. The yields are still extremely low. Uh, if we look at this from a fundamental perspective, uh, purchase power parity, the euro is undervalued against the US dollar. Uh, and let's not forget, I'll give you an amazing number. Back in 1989, Germany had a 75 billion surplus. They lost all of that because of the unification with uh, Eastern Germany. Right now, they have the surplus, 250 billion. So we have the improvement. They are going to, to acknowledge over the next few days GDP growth of 2.5. So this is why, even if we move lower in the euro against the USD, you can see here I have the market profile, and I also have some weekly and monthly pivots. So the area that I'm looking to do business is around if we have a movement lower in the euro due to uh, interest rate expectations in the US, I'm doing business around 114, 115. This is uh, the area that I would like to, to participate, to look actively for a long. Uh, or otherwise, if we move a move, if we have a move outside the value area high, above 116.70, a move above 117 opens the road for higher uh, valuations. But the driver here is on the left. It's the yields. It's all about the yields. Now, when it comes to the majors, euro, the pound, the US dollar, the factors, this is the difficulty, the risk for you. The factors are political. Civil war at the Republican Party, tax cuts, uh, the ECB, are they going to, to, to let the door open for a continuation of QE in September or not? What happens with Catalonia? Uh, you have a European South, there are many issues. You have a coalition negotiations in Germany. It's difficult to trade that. We can't trade political news. In the UK, it is like we have a Game of Thrones <laughs> in real life. Uh, one day the pound is moving up, next is moving down because 40 members of the parliament uh, 
don't wish to offer their support to Theresa May anymore. So it is quite quite difficult to trade in this environment. That's why my suggestion is to focus on uh, other catalysts that are more clear and you can benefit from this. For example, what happens with the currencies down under? Political developments are also important there, but also inflation, interest rate expectations, interest rate differentials are very important. Look at, on the right, chart the Aussie versus the Kiwi. Uh, interest rate expectations, growth expectations are in favor of Australia. We see from the bottom here from the weekly and monthly pivots you can see the high volume node with concentration of volumes we broke today outside on the uh, on the outside. We are looking actively to establish a long position here because also the situation when it comes to New Zealand is not very good politically and economically. They will be forced to be more accommodative and the deficit will widen. This is why every professional, every institutional investor has a, an outlook to go long the Aussie versus the Kiwi. Unless, of course, something dramatic happens from China that will affect Australia. Because of the troubles in New Zealand, you can see here, I got long the pound versus the kiwi this morning. Why did I do this? Because there is 3.1 possibly inflation in United Kingdom, and now Carney is forced to write a letter, an open letter to, to the Chancellor about why we have this inflation and the measures that need to be taken to, to fight this. So this is why I have a bullish outlook on the pound, not against the USD. What I'm trying to do is I'm choosing a strong currency against a weak one, strong expectations about interest rates against another currency with weaker expectations. I identify the high volume nodes, the value, and the breakout. So uh, the bottom line is we have lots of political developments. We need to very carefully select the areas and moving forward, something that will affect everything, forex, equities, bonds, society, it is this chart. Uh, this is, I think, probably the most important chart on macro. Chinese two-year yields, uh, you can see uh, monthly, the, the monthly chart since 2005. Look what happens roughly when we reach this area, 4%. Look what has happened since after the first half of 2016. Look at this big move higher. Why is this happening? The Chinese are very eager to tighten conditions. They have a huge bubble in their economy. It grew from 104% back in 2006 debt has grown to 260%. The figures for September, if we annualize them, are in six months high at 275 billion. This is, it's even worse than Greece, 240%, sorry, 260% uh, debt versus the GDP. They are, tried, they are trying to tighten conditions. Look what is happening to the yields. Is this sustainable though? Let me ask this question. Is this sustainable to have for almost 4% short-term interest rates? What happens? Something has to give. Uh, and let me, to, to end this, um, uh, let me use the words of the head of People's Bank of China, Zhu, who said, and I'm quoting him now, safeguarding the bottom line of no systematic financial risks. And he warns of hidden, complex, sudden, contagious, and hazardous dangers in the Chinese economy. And, and this comes from the head of the People's Bank of China. Something has to give. Moving into 2018, I think, my suspicion is, gut feeling, that it's got to be the US dollar. Because emerging markets and the whole world, they cannot afford uh, a strong dollar at this level. So this is the big risk moving forward, the big black swan, but we are all scared. 
don't know if you would like to ask me something regarding this or move on with with something else. I, just, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously the 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 political you know Trump situation where he's not he has he's basically a lame duck before he started. Um, is that going to affect? Is that going to eventually undermine the dollar, or is that actually going to strengthen the dollar? We have a big divergence, Zach, right now between what the Fed says and what the market believes. If we look at the yields, let me go back to that 10-year bond chart. If we look at Fed expectations and if we look at the futures market, we see that there is a divergence between the Fed and what the market believes. Uh, the market thinks that the, uh, the yields will move lower uh, than uh, with what the Fed is suggesting. So that is going to be the, the million dollar question. Who is right? Is it the Fed or is it the market? I think this time it's going to be Mr. Market that is correct. It's very difficult for Donald Trump to move forward with his agenda because who is going to pay for this? You want tax cuts, fine. You want to invest in infrastructure, great. How are you going to pay for this? That means even bigger deficits. The results will not impact the economy in the short term, but over one to three year periods, deficits matter. So how are you going to solve this with raising interest rates? I do not think so. So I think it will be a repeat of 2016. If you remember back then, they were telling us about four interest rate hikes. And how many did we have? One in December. So this is why, you know, I'm again very cautious and I think uh, we need to pay very close attention to both political as well as fundamental developments. Fotis, it's Simon here. We shall do that. <clears throat> Could I relay a question from one of our listeners, uh, Edward, is asking, he says, can you shed any light on the current move in the Euro-Japanese yen which seems to have no confirming moves in the dollar yen and the euro dollar. Yes, of course. Let me switch to, to my MetaTrader to show you the euro yen chart. I've got it right here. And I'll tell you how I approach this. Now, step number one, I'm looking at the fundamentals, interest rate differentials, and so on. We have an economy, which is the Eurozone's economy, growing fine, 2.5%, huge surplus by Germany, 250 billion, it's astonishing. And we are looking to end the QE uh, starting 2018. On the other hand, you have an economy, like the Japanese, where the central bank says, I will do whatever it takes to reach my inflation target. That means we are going to be very accommodative uh, and provide liquidity to the system. So the interest rate differentials, and you also have a divergence at a monetary uh, policy level, that clearly favors the euro. The risk for, for a potential downside move to the euro is if you have a strong risk of environment. That means if equities drop and we have risk aversion, that will maybe cause uh, also the ECB to, to leave the door open for an extension of the QE even after September. But at the moment, look what is happening. We, we had the expected move higher in the euro against the yen, consolidation breakout, consolidation, test the highs technically, it's, it is breaking high again. As long as equity markets are fine and they are ignoring the fundamentals who are screaming that the markets are expensive, high yielding currencies will do better than low yielding currencies. The carry trade will be fine. If we have strong risk of environment, if suddenly you have risk aversion, people running to safe havens, this is where I think the yen, uh, in this environment, the yen is going to benefit. Okay, thank you for, for that, Fotis. Zach, do you have any other questions for Fotis? Uh, no, I mean, I just, I suppose my my perennial uh, question is is whether the, the Japanese yen is, is really a safe haven, but uh, uh, perhaps this is not the time to go into that. Um, it's all about liquidity, I think. It's very liquid. Sometimes, uh, I agree with you, Zach, sometimes they just rush to the, to, to the asset that offers the best liquidity. And 
and having a central bank that provides so much liquidity might be helpful in, in, in a risk event. No, but it's just, just a weird market. I mean, you know, there's, a, there's an earthquake in Japan and then, you know, people will start buying in. I mean, it, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a very strange, it, it seems to be a convention that it's a safe haven rather than a reality, but uh, you can't argue with the market, can you? No, exactly. That's why we start to incorporate behavioral factors more and more into our analysis and trying to understand sentiment and behavior of participants. Okay. I for, mean, the other thing, the other thing, yes, yes, go on. For this, I'm, I'm just conscious of time. Um, we're, we're, we're getting on through the time. You are coming back and presenting a longer webinar at our day, our, our monthly summit event on the 23rd of November. So, so we'll Exactly. Have, on the 23rd, I will be here with you. Yes. Right, well, and we'll have almost a full hour there to, to go into a lot more of this. But uh, of I think we'll we'll move on now because I'm conscious we've got, we've got another. We've got John Adamson uh, who's been waiting. Uh, and then we're going to go back to Owen Roberts uh, from Two Blocks Trading. Uh, so we're, we're trying to, to fit a lot in. So so if that's okay, we'll, 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 we'll move on. So, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Zach, um, one question just for you as I hand the presenter roll back to your screen. Um, Pete says, to what degree do you think the Saudi problem is affecting markets and will it blow up into something much worse? Well, I think they're trying their best. I mean, the uh, the way that they sort of uh, they started arresting people and doing all this uh, um, very weird stuff uh, regarding... Uh, we're sort of pretending that they're the moral police on, 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 on various uh, members of the royal family there uh, was very strange and it seemed to be designed particularly, I mean, exactly to create uh, um, nervousness and uh, to get the oil price up. So I think, I mean, you know, the, the way things are going, they'll, they'll even bring out democracy just to get around over the line um, in this situation. But uh, uh, I'm not sure quite how much they can uh, get these things going. Um, you know, we've seen the market so immune to even the worst stresses, you know, nuclear strains even over the summer. So um, I think that Saudis can huff and puff, but uh, I would be surprised if um, th there was too much effect on the markets. And also, obviously, their, their goal really seems to be getting the Aramco um, situation, um, the IPO uh, put to bed. Once that's done, then I think, or once it can be seen that it'll go okay, uh, I think uh, these uh, activities will stop. Okay, thank you very much. We're bringing uh, John Adamson uh, into the, the the webinar now. John, one of the, the founders of sharetop.com, uh, is going to discuss a couple of things. Maybe. John, your microphone is unmuted. You should be able to hear me and we should be able to hear you. Good morning. Okay, John, if you can... Hear me if you want to test your microphone. Okay, so I don't think John is is not able to come through. It's uh, it it, it this is the this is the morning <laughs> that we that we dread uh, when the the technology uh, is uh, erratic. Uh, I think to say the least. Um, but I think what we'll do is we can go now back Hello. to. Hello. Oh, there we go. John, good morning. It's Simon speaking. Hi, Simon. How are you doing? Sorry about that. I'm very well. No, I, 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 I guessed you were just getting logged in there and, and we could hear something. So good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I know you've been sitting uh, through the event so far. Um, and we, we've looked at sort of cryptos. We started out with some shares from Russell Jones and uh, cryptos and uh, the Forex market. We're coming back to to, to look at shares um, with you for the next, uh, just, just maybe the next sort of six seven minutes. Can we, would you like to cross to your screen or are we just going to do this in, in a sort of an interview style? We can do it as an interview style. I don't know, Zach, if you want to bring up a chart for RMP. RMP, yes, if that's the Red Emperor, is it? What is it? That's Red Emperor, yes. Well, there we go. Not a rather messy chart, but uh, in a range, let's say. Yeah, so 
I guess to introduce a company, messy chart, you could, some investors may call them a messy company. Uh, don't quote me on that one, obviously, but uh, they've got a couple of assets in the Philippines and Georgia, their oil and gas play, uh, basically based out in Australia. Uh, they've not had much success over the last couple of years. Uh, particularly with their Philippines asset, uh, which is an oil play. Uh, it's had about 25 million uh, US gone into it and very little success come out of that. So that appears to have stopped, as does the farming at Georgia. But I'm looking at this as a, a new entry. So on the 1st of November, they had their quarterlies out, uh, which basically confirmed they've got about just over 10 million Aussie dollars in the bank, roughly six million cash. Uh, and they just announced within that RNS uh, that they've actually paid 640k US dollar uh, to acquire a number of leases in California, a number of oil and gas prospective leases. Uh, that's going to be announced in the next couple of weeks. Share price since the sort of Georgia Philippine sort of farmings and JVs have sort of crashed, we're going back a couple of years now, back to 2015. So you'll see the price, if you just go back on that chart a little bit, Zach, you'll be able to see that at that point it was about 4.69 pence. So the market cap currently in English, in British pounds even, you can see is probably they're just under five mil. So cash versus MCAP is looking very healthy at the moment. The main question is on the, the management team and their ability to deliver. If you to have a look at their website, you'll notice a lot of it is out of date, much of it up to a couple of years. So it doesn't really give you a lot of confidence, but if you look at that last RNS from the 1st of November uh, and maybe ignore the fact or take into account they've actually just been suspended from the ASX as well. So they're dual listed. Uh, ASX obviously have slightly more stringent regulation, I believe. Uh, and it's essentially the suspension's due to the fact that they've not really performed in any way to expectations over the last two years so the, the news flow coming out has been very sparse to say the least very little updates on how those two philippines and georgia prospects are going so you had an entry point of 1.15 last week that's now moved up to about 1.49 pence but it's a very large spread. I think the last time I looked at it this morning, the spread was about 47%. But I do feel the fact that they've paid out this other oil and gas firm in the States to acquire these leases, uh, read the RNS, check the detail. It, it looks like the next couple of weeks are going to see something quite interesting come out for that company. But they definitely need to do some work on their comms. That, that's, you know, that, that's probably going to, what they need to do to get their ASX listing back back on tow. So that's Red Emperor from my side. Are you there, Zach? Um, so, yeah, I, mean, uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing on that is, sorry, I mean, the, on that sort of situation, you sort of wonder whether a company's actually asleep. I mean, you know, there's, you know, that they care about their investors. I think, uh, Again, you know, not talking out of school, if you look at the management, they've almost all got interest in other companies. So, and which is not abnormal, but I think we've, when, when every single board member has maybe two or three interests in another company, you wonder how much time they're actually spending on, on that particular company that, you know, if you're putting your money in. So, again, if, if you're looking to invest, it's, it's a consideration to take. Uh, we are trying to get more information out of the company at Share Talk, so <clears throat> they are they're a company we're looking to interview. Uh, but I, this is just you know my own sort of personal research. Uh, but although I must highlight the fact I actually 
the stock came to light from from Paul Johnson. So it's a stock Paul has been buying of late, and she's been open about. But I don't believe many people have actually picked up on the fact. Okay. The Paul, Paul Johnson, a metal tiger fame for people who are um, not sure. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So moving on, uh, I'm going to move on to Susanda. Completely different stock. Uh, ticker SOS. Do you want to just bring up the chart on that one, Zach? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's another AIM stock. Just listed on AIM, this one. Uh, very different in a, in a number of ways. Uh, firstly, in that it's an online women's clothing retailer. Uh, IPO'd. 2nd of November, so just under two weeks ago, two weeks on Thursday. Uh, major shareholders include Nigel Ray of uh, 4.6% and Mighton Group at 6.2%. 10% owned by the board, uh, joint CEOs in Alison Hall and Julie Lavington, who are ex, well, editor and publishing director of Look Magazine. Uh, so IPO'd 15.1 pence, currently looking about just over 19 pence this morning. So a, a fairly decent start to life on AIM. Uh, yeah, I mean, from, have... from what you've told me there, sorry, um, John, I mean, it, yeah. I, from what I've heard already, um, you know, it's just like all the, all, got all the big guns in there. Um, there's nothing really to think about really in terms of um, buying the shares. Well, some might say, some might say, I don't, I don't believe re retail have particularly picked up on this as yet. I know there's been a little bit of, you know, there's, there's been some, some blogs written about it recently, but I'm not sure how many people have really picked up on that. Uh, a lot of people will look at this and think, is it the next Boohoo? Is it the next ASOS? Per from a personal level, I don't think it is. Uh, it, 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 it's certainly got life in it, but it's, if you look at the demographic that they're targeting for the, for the, you know, for the sales, it's, they're sort of looking at the sort of affluent sort of 30 to 50 year olds, in my opinion, that's the sort of target area. Whereas I think Boohoo and ASOS is a much wider demographic, a, a much a lower budget area. So therefore you, your volumes are going to be higher. Uh, that said, you know the markups on on what uh, Sander should be making uh, should be very lucrative. But the, the initial financial figures that we've seen is net sales of just under half a million, gross sales of about 850k for last year. They only launched September 2016. Uh, so, you know, one of the key focuses of the first day of dealings document was to sort of put out that the first few months are going to be spent increasing brand awareness. So you've got two, you know, PR experts at the top of the tree with Alison and Julie. They've gone very much down a sort of celebrity endorsement route. So if you it's like a who's who of female daytime TV. Uh, the ladies from Loose Women, This Morning, ITV News, uh, Fern Cotton, and Holly Willoughby, th those kind of people. And they're, they're getting a lot of coverage in other magazines like Female and what have you. So I think that they've definitely got a strong future. And I think when the liquidity comes, looking at the trades, I think there's maybe a few people exiting post-IPO who have possibly, you know, been in for the seeding stage, but I think once that clears and and they get a stronger retail audience and maybe the addition of another institutional, I think we're going to possibly see it fly in the future. So it's one one for the watch list. Yes, uh, well, Holly will it be crack it for them? Uh, who knows? Um, but it sounds a bit of a, like a a bit of a me too offering, and also very crowded marketplace in general. And, um, you know, you probably want to see um, some sort of more solid evidence that they were actually getting a foothold, wouldn't you? 
Exactly. I mean, I think if you, if they were to, the, the next thing is to see what, what they put out in terms of news, you know, what's really going to drive the share price up. Because at the moment, we've not we've not seen anything other than a couple of holdings, RNSs. So, you know, from share talks perspective, the way we cover stocks is we, we look at the sort of momentum news stories. So for us at the moment, this is something that looks quite nice on on the outset of it but it needs a bit of meat on the bone to really get it moving now so we'll see maybe some concessions in some of your major stores like your john lewis or your harvey nicks i think that, that's the kind of target market these guys are going for uh but we'll have to see and you know we need a bit more financial data as well really before we can make any firm decisions on that but for now it's it's maybe a a decent punt, one might say. Yeah, well, I, have to say I'm, I hadn't heard of it until now, so and I'm, I'm obviously That's the other keen, problem. On, so keen on the back of market. myself. <laughs> exactly. My, well, my, I did my own little market research the other day. I've got uh, three sisters, a number of sister-in-laws and mother-in-laws and what have you. They all read the women's magazines. They all know Look magazine, so they, then, so they see the people wearing the stuff in the magazines. But they're not necessarily aware of Sassanda themselves, so it's got they've got a long way to go, I think, really. Well, even I've heard of Look magazine, but maybe that uh, that maybe that, that might be incriminating uh, to reveal. There that, you so go. I, I guess if they, can, if they can get that same brand awareness they've done for Look, we you know it actually takes time. <laughs> but you know, if they can get anywhere near that, then they'll they'll do very well. All right. Well, uh, luckily I'm outside the catchment area, even if I was the right sex. So uh, I think I'm unfair to <laughs> all of this, but. Uh, um, is, uh, so those are, those are your two picks, John? They're my two picks for the day, Zach. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, and um, I, I suppose we'll go back to Simon. Thank you very thank much, you. John, and uh, good to, to have you. Thank you for that. Uh, Zach, if we're, if we're okay, we're going to cross back to Owen Roberts. Um, Owen had a, a, an issue with the, the mic earlier on, but uh, he's still here. If we've got just got another another five minutes or so, um, we're just going to hear Owen's story um, on, on the crypto just, just before we finish up for the morning. So um, we'll take the microphone off again, and before we cross over, We'll see if Owen can can hear us now. Uh, good morning, Owen. You should be able to hear and speak. Good morning. I hope so. Oh, you're coming through loud and clear now. That's great. Let's go across to your screen. We'll do the same as we did before, making the presenter. Um, Zach, you're still uh, with us as well. Okay. So I have sound, and can you guys see my screen? Um, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. So we'll... Excellent. Good morning, Zach. Hello. Good morning. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about cryptos again, but I know that David covered Bitcoin in quite a lot of detail earlier. But for me, I just wanted to talk about uh, some of the other cryptocurrencies, maybe one or two of the altcoins, as they are called. Just a very quick idea I have there. Um, for us, the, the the reason to be looking at this is is what Russell mentioned at the top of the show. It's this real flat stuff, this sideways stuff that we're seeing at the moment. And although Tom, who is the other bloke from Two Blokes Trading, and I, we only started trading a couple of years ago, so we are slightly less experienced than uh, some of your other guests. But um, we, after messing around as so many do at the beginning of their careers, settled on technical swing trading, which was all very well uh, until this sort of market happens. And I know the day traders with... ATRs down here um, are going to be feeling these issues as well. But the last few months or so, with everything going sideways, in particular in cable, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in a trade now for six, seven weeks uh, in, in cable, whereas my back testing would suggest I'm normally in these trades for six or seven days. So we were having a conversation and we're looking to find volatility or at least something to trade elsewhere. We decided that wasn't greedy, that was just sensible after speaking to some of the guests we get on our podcast. So we have cryptos on our minds. We're running a, a crypto trading competition at the moment, in fact, over at Two Blokes Trading. Uh, it's demo, don't worry, Zach, we're not, uh, <laughs> we're not uh, encouraging anyone to, to run the risk of ruin. Um, but it, it sort of got me thinking that this is where we should be looking for the volatility. And although we've been looking at this since uh, trading cryptos has really been a thing in terms of the CFDs, uh, there wasn't really a lot of opportunity outside of Bitcoin. So this is Bitcoin July through to end of September. But as you can see, it's just massively correlated here with Ethereum that's overlaid. 
And so although we could trade Bitcoin, there wasn't a great deal of point in trading the altcoins. Litecoin here as well, to some extent, has been correlated. Um, and we really thought that uh, we, we needed to wait until that wasn't the case before we could start trading anything outside of Bitcoin. If you fast forward slightly, you can really see that correlation is completely broken down in the last few months uh, since sort of the beginning of October. So they have unpegged, if you like, whereas the market was moving in lockstep when Bitcoin went up, all the other altcoins followed. And when it went down, the other altcoins followed. Now, now they are kind of doing their own thing, which for me means there is an opportunity to trade them as independent products outside of Bitcoin. Um, the issue, though, has then been that we've then started seeing more sideways stuff on all of these altcoins. Uh, that's Ethereum, and we have Ripple, which really has been doing very little. And then Litecoin. Litecoin is an interesting one because the founder of Litecoin, Charlie Lee, tweeted this on the 5th of November. Looks like $55 is the new $4 for Litecoin. What I think he means by that is if you look at $4, <laughs> as you can see, there wasn't much trading opportunity there. And he tweeted this about this point here when $55 was just going sideways. But I think that Charlie Lee and others are coming from a, a tech background, right? They're coming at this from a perspective of these products. And is $55 the fair value of Litecoin? But for me, um, right now, you can't use these. These are not currencies and they're speculative vehicles. There is no actual fair value, right? So the value is entirely what we as traders, as speculators, have decided. These markets back at $4 were driven by the very, very small percentage of people that had heard of cryptocurrencies, and now they're being driven by traders and speculators. So I don't see this as reaching a value that is going to stay out. I see this as a consolidating market. Same with Ethereum, particularly with Ripple. And now that they've unpegged from Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is doing its thing, uh, to use a technical term, and it's not strictly being pegged, um, but it suggests to me that although trading Bitcoin does make sense, and um, personally, you know, I'm long up back up to uh, the previous high of 7,500, give or take, um, I don't believe that we need to be ignoring these other currencies. I think there are some strong moves to come. Whether they go up or down is anybody's guess, but you only have to then look at what's happened with Dash, where you have another consolidating market is going pretty much sideways, nothing great is happening, and then you get these sudden moves. So if people are looking for a potential large trading opportunity in the immediate term, and they are twiddling their thumbs somewhat in the normal fiat currency world, then for me, this is what I'm keeping an eye on. Ethereum, Ripple, Litecoin. I think something is going to happen, something big is going to happen. Unless I'm completely wrong and Charlie Lee is right and these things find a level and they just trund along for the next several years, in which case you can't exactly lose money because you won't be in the market. No, I mean, are there any, um, I mean, obviously it's a very technical question, but is, isn't there going to be like um, winners and losers here where let's say Bitcoin uh, is superseded by um, Ethereum and Ethereum is superseded by uh, IOTA and it goes on like that. And so you have, you know, you have, uh, it's a bit like the pop world that, you know, you have sort of, you know, d dominant and then, you know, the dominant trends and then they, they fade. Uh, and, you know, the, te because the technology changes all the time. You can't, you won't have, consistent winners and or even consistent losers i completely agree and uh for me i i am uh, invested in the physical cryptocurrency uh bitcoin from uh earlier this year at about four thousand after the the previous uh drop so uh, uh this sort of level here initially i thought it was a dead cat bounce but then as we saw it keeps going and at the same time, I bought into Ethereum and Litecoin for that exact reason where I didn't want to just try and pick the winner in a horse race. Um, it's well documented that Bitcoin has technical issues that although it's first to market and it's the most well known, it isn't by any stretch of imagination the best piece of technology in this sector. Um, but it is still by factors of many, 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 uh, the most Googled, if you like, which is a, a strange metric. but if, if this is being driven by people hearing from a friend of a friend about Bitcoin and piling in and buying, then there's a lot of money to be made, I think, still 
from a speculation point of view. I mean, Bitcoin Cash, everyone was worried it was going to take over, but even last uh, few days, it had one twentieth as much search history um, as as Bitcoin itself, which suggests to me that the, 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 the retail guys, the guys that are pummeling or piling in in order to make a quick buck and not going to be driving that up, they're going to still be driving up Bitcoin. So I think trying to be right on this and pick the winner is is a fool's game, really certainly for me. I, I'm not about to go and do a, a master's degree in you, you know computing and, and photography and all these sort of things uh, to try and understand uh, how these things work. But um, I think there's still certainly from a physical buy and hold perspective a lot to be gained from just buying into the market, generally spreading it uh, out slightly, you know, Ethereum, I bought because of the smart contract stuff, Litecoin, because it ostensibly could be better for small transactions, although Bitcoin Cash might take that away from it, and Bitcoin, because it's the big daddy, so I'm spread across, but from a short-term trading perspective, I kind of try and ignore all that noise and just look at the technicals and look at the levels and the, the, the round numbers that these people, that uh, fellow traders like to trade between and, and just try and follow the herd and make some money rather than try and be right. Okay, that uh, sounds fair. I just hope that I've, my my nightmare is that one day they just say, "Oh, Bitcoin is uh, no, it's just a punt because it's been taken over by um, some other coin, and uh, it goes from six thousand to five hundred or, or something like that." And you just have a, like a, a total annihilation. I think you might be right. I think there maybe needs to be an exit plan. I think that um, trying to hold Bitcoin for all eternity would be really like buying AOL shares and expecting to hold them for 50 years. I think that um, for me, if it hits 10,000, I've more than doubled my money from 4,000. Uh, you know, thank you and good night for me. <laughs> uh, if, if it gets there, if it doesn't get there, then I, I will. I mean, this might sound cowardly, but I'll certainly be back out and not losing money at 4,000 because I think if it hits that point, um, but that is that's you know, it's a massive uh, retracement from the previous highs and would suggest to me that maybe it's had its time. I could, of course, be very, very wrong. OK, well, we'll see how everything progresses. OK, Owen, thank you and good luck with that. Just uh, just quickly before you go, who, what's the latest podcast on the site at the moment? Uh, so the latest one right now went up on Monday is uh, Kevin Davey, who won the World Cup Championship of Futures Trading and came second twice or within three years building trading algorithms. So if that is of interest to people, then he is, he is the guy to listen to. So yeah, twoblokestrading.com, uh, and anybody can listen to that there. Very much recommended. Sounds great. Oh, and thank you. Thanks for staying. I'm glad we got you in there. Uh, got the technology sorted. Uh, this, this week's been, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're trying a, a few different things, um, but we'll get all these things ironed out and we'll be a lot smoother as we go into the future. So thank you for, for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Uh, Thanks for having me. Zach, I think we'll we'll just wrap it up there if, if you're okay to wrap it yeah. up there. I think that's a good idea. Just, uh, just want to look. I mean, just to finish off, just with the, the stocks. Um, as I said, mentioned before, uh, Vodafone and Tesco are still uh, near the top of the table, up nearly five percent, and uh, ITV down nearly four percent after its update. So, um, those are the movers of the day on the stock front. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for for joining us. Uh, back again uh, tomorrow morning, and uh, thank you, Zach, for hosting us. And uh, we'll speak to you again shortly. Thank you, Simon.